Good afternoon. It is April 17th, and welcome to the Transportation and Environment Committee. Uh, this is our second committee session focusing on the proposed FY25 operating budget, and today we're going to be reviewing uh, various uh, items within the Department of Environmental Protection, uh, notably the Climate Change Planning NDA, the Water Quality Protection Fund, the Recycling and Resource Management Budget, and a newly proposed CIP project uh, that the County Executive uh, is proposing. Uh, the first item that we'll take up is the general fund, which is $10.7 million and will help support uh, different programs like the Environmental Compliance Division, the Building and Transportation Systems Division, and it will support our climate programming goal. And we all know that our climate uh, demands that we take action. We have goals here in the county uh, that need to be met not only for our current situation, but our future situation, reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by 2027 and reducing them 100% by 2035. And the work that we will talk about today will help get us there. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Lovchenko to kick us off on the packet. Uh, sure. First, uh, we have a lot of folks from the executive branch here today. I thought we'd allow them to um, introduce themselves and, and make a few comments. If anyone wants to make comments, we'll turn it over to Director Munger if you want to start us off, if you're prepared to do so. Thank you so much, Council Member, and uh, very pleased to be with you. I just want to say a very sincere thank you to uh, this group here today and, and your fellow, fellow colleagues on Council. You know, I think as you said, Council Member, uh, there is no time like the present in terms of working on these issues. And I think that as we walk through the presentation today, I'm really excited to talk about some really good examples of not only our plans moving forward, but also uh, really terrific examples of how investments this council has made in the department historically have really paid dividends on moving forward on our climate and environment priorities. So really looking forward to the conversation. Great. Thank you. Anybody else? We're good. Mr. Lovchenko, back to you. Uh, sure. So as you mentioned, we have uh, the DEP budget today as well as the Climate Change Planning NDA. Uh, the DEP budget itself uh, has a tax-supported general fund component to it. And as uh, the, the council has, or count, the committees have already started doing, uh, the council president's approach this year was to uh, uh, identify those new ad enhancement type items in, in the budget and those would be um, conveyed to the full council for discussion. Uh, so you will see in the general fund component, uh, in the general fund portion of the, of the DEP budget and in the climate change NDA, the recommendation for those items to be grouped and moved on to that master list, if you will. However, for the water quality protection fund and the um, uh, resource and recycling management uh, budget, since those are self-supporting enterprise funds, they're not subject to those same uh, rules, if you will, since they, they cannot contribute to a um, general fund or tax-supported solution. Uh, so they're looked at uh, in their own context of their funds. And to the degree changes are made in those up or down, they would affect the rates and charges in those particular funds. Uh, so that's why you see a little distinction today between the budgets to how some of these items are handled. Um, also, I, I do have some general information in the packet about DEP, including uh, vacancies and laps. This is an issue that's been, uh, that the council has discussed the last couple of years. Uh, generally speaking, the county government has seen uh, significant increases uh, compared to historic numbers, at least, of vacancies and length of time of vacancies, and that's true in DEP as well. Uh, however, uh, what is different this year is that uh, OMB um, in response to uh, s these concerns, uh, revisited laps across uh, the county government and uh, did and recommended spe specifically in DEP's case to increase laps uh, in the FY25 budget. So in, in my packet, I've noted that it's, um, there's a significant increase in the assumed laps, which means that uh, there's an assumed, in, uh, assumed um, there's an assumption that there will be more vacancies or longer vacancies than had previously been assumed. 
Um, we still have some catch up to do uh, in uh, compared to where things are now with the vacancies, as I've noted in the packet, and getting to that lapse rate. Uh, but DEP has provided information uh, to staff about the status of the recruitment for these positions. Uh, and their expectation of when they'll fill them either late in FY24 or in the first or second quarter of FY25. Uh, so we can certainly let that process play out and revisit uh, the uh, vacancy and lapse issue uh, next year. But that's, that's an issue you probably will see come up across other departments as well uh, this year. And in fact, in some cases, DP has reallocated positions and, and uh, in one case abolished a vacancy, a long time vacancy. So these are the kinds of things that the council was interested in the departments looking at. Um, I, I appreciate you elevating that when the budget was introduced. The county executive and chief administrative officer made a, uh, an explicit point in, in stating that there were a number of positions that had been repurposed uh, within county government since that was a focus of the council's last year, um, taking a look at those vacancies. So, Thank you, Mr. Lovchenko. Uh, the other item I wanted to briefly note is um, for all the budgets this year, uh, the Office <coughs> of Racial Equity and Social Justice uh, used a operating budget equity tool to uh, and asked questions of the departments in terms of their operations and also their uh, budget uh, and provided a grade, if you will, uh, for the departments. Uh, in the case of DEP, they got a pretty good grade, eight out of 11. Uh, which uh, the office categorizes as a strong commitment to advancing racial equity and social justice. Uh, so in, as you can imagine, with a lot of the DEP programs, they do have a lot of uh, community-based efforts and geographically-based efforts uh, that lend themselves to a uh, uh, racial equity and social justice lens that they are applying in these different cases. And we can uh, dig deeper into that if, if the committee is interested in particular programs. Uh, but I just wanted to lay that out at the beginning, that they uh, were seen at least by the, the Office of Racial Equity and Social Justice as being in pretty good shape uh, as of this budget. So getting into the uh, general fund budget itself, I'm going to uh, do a few overview numbers that appear on page six of my packet. Uh, this breaks out the general fund budget by personnel costs, operating costs, and positions. Uh, the Executives recommended budget for uh, the general fund is about $10.7 million. Uh, this is about a $1.6 million increase or about 17.8%. Um, I've noted in the um, uh, lower on the page uh, two, two different sets of, of uh, changes in the budget. And th this is uh, also something that the committee will probably see with other budgets. You have um, changes up or down that are not intended to affect service levels per se. They're dealing with cost increases, cost decreases, changes, things like that, but not intended to reflect uh, the programs uh, in terms of uh, <coughs> service level, if you will, uh, or quality of the programs. And so you see a lot of these adjustments, whether they're annualization of, of positions, compensation adjustments, which are dealt with countywide, um, uh, and other uh, type uh, printing and mail, motor pool, things like that, uh, that uh, these de uh, all departments have to have to deal with from year to year. Uh, those changes are not what uh, we're looking to try to move forward for a full council review. So staffs just identified them and noted that they are um, just basically the cost of doing business uh, in 25 uh, or moving from 24 to 25, and staff is is comfortable with those adjustments uh, shown on page six. However, there are other adjustments. These are on page seven of the packet. Uh, these are um, substantive changes to the budget that do affect uh, service in some way. And as you mentioned earlier, we, as we have in the last several years, there are a number of climate change related issues. Uh, but one item in particular I wanted to note uh, distinct from that in, in some ways is the uh, implementation of Bill 1822, electric leaf blowers. The committee has already taken up this issue in a couple ways. One, there was an FY24 supplemental uh, to move forward with the rebate program uh, and education outreach associated with that in 24 so that it could move forward July 1, 25, and the committee and the council supported that. Uh, and then also the regulation itself uh, that uh, uh, impl would implement the, re the uh, rebate program, uh, that was also approved uh, by the council. Uh, and there's a fiscal impact associated with this that was discussed during that uh, regulation um, 
uh, when the regulation came over. And uh, the FY25 budget continues that, uh, the, the, the costs associated with that. Now, with the rebate itself, which does have a sunset of uh, December 2026, I believe, uh, that those funds will phase out, uh, but there will be other costs associated with this that will be ongoing. And for FY25, we still have the full rebate issue and all the education outreach associated with that, which is loaded in the budget request this year. Uh, so staff is recommending approval of that particular item, even though it is an addition and enhancement, it is one that is mandated by the law and the regulation that the council recently adopted. You want to keep going? Yep. All the other items, though, uh, we have, I'll, I'll just note them here. Uh, there's a, a new position in operating support for solar, solar strategic plan development. Uh, there are also uh, resources provided um, to help with energy audits for under-resourced buildings subject to the building energy performance standards uh, law and regulation. Uh, there's, a, um, uh, there's some money also for energy ambassadors, which we can talk about. And then also um, technical support and incentives for electric vehicle community charging infrastructure deployment. So these are all uh, DEP's efforts to um, insert money into these different uh, climate change areas uh, to move the needle uh, in different ways. Uh, however, they are all additions uh, and or enhancements. And so they will, uh, regardless of what the committee discusses today, they will go on that master list I mentioned earlier uh, and have to come back to the full council for discussion at a later date. Um, but uh, I guess with that, I think it would be helpful to hear from uh, the department on these specific items uh, and their thoughts on them. And also if, if there's some perspective for the committee in terms of uh, uh, priority going forward, yep. uh, this would also be an opportunity for the committee to, to note those items that they feel particularly strongly about. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Director well, Monger. Well, or to you. Well, yeah, what I prefer is um, we'll ask some questions. Oh, sure. And, you know, we, we have a number of items, so there'll be plenty of time for everybody to speak, I'm sure. So thank you. Th thank you, Mr. Ovchenko. Mm -hmm. uh, so within this packet, a lot of good work, clearly the work um, that that has taken place. Um, you know, you just mentioned the leaf blower proposal. I'm glad to see that finally in the base budget. Uh, it's taken quite a while through passing the legislation, supporting the supplemental, uh, but now we're in a, a, a position to have it in the uh, in the base budget, which is good. And for everybody who's following, uh, leaf, gas-powered leaf blowers will be prohibited for sale starting July 1st, and then the total prohibition on gas-powered leaf blower use in the county will begin July 1st of 2025. So that's the transition uh, as adopted um, through our democratic process here at the council. Um, I wish it were faster, mm -hmm. but here we are. Um, the other thing that we're planning for is greener buildings and building energy performance standards. And so I'm glad uh, to see in here that there is $275,000 for audits. I have great concern that that is not enough, and so I, I welcome thoughts and comments from uh, the director, from his team, um, uh, or Ms. Smucker as well, who, who can just talk about the executive's process for planning for, for the BEPS regulation to be ad adopted at some point in time, and let me just provide greater context there. When the regulation regarding building energy performance standards was sent over to the council. This committee has already had three or four committee work sessions, starting with a deep dive and conversation with our health care providers as to how hospitals will make the conversion. Um, we also had a conversation with affordable housing providers about how they will be able to make the conversion. And we also spoke with our life sciences biotech companies as the third largest hub in the country in the life sciences sector, so how will they make that conversion as well? We have now paused, as all other policy work does here at the council, to undertake the budget, but once we're done with the budget, we will resume those conversations. Um, we've already had requests for uh, commercial housing providers, apartment buildings. We've had requests from the faith community, uh, and uh, we've also had requests from condo and townhouse owners uh, and common ownership communities about how they 
what what they will need to do to make these. And so the two hundred and seventy five thousand dollars is is a very low starting point. But share with us how we're going to help uh, make these conversions and provide the education and resources to to all of these different facilities. The easy one goes to your director mm -hmm. Munger. Thanks, Council Member. Uh, and I just want to acknowledge that uh, it's a very well-timed question because we, have, for the last couple of days, have had a really terrific and robust conversation at the Energy Summit, which the Council, which, excuse me, which the County has held for the last 11 years. And it was uh, hundreds of experts working on, on uh, solutions to these exact types of issues. So um, it's an exciting week to continue the conversation. I just want to note at the outset that I mentioned some of the terrific uh, return on investment, if you will, that the council has gotten for progress made that you've previously uh, entrusted with the department with. And uh, building energy performance standards is really a good example of uh, great work we've been doing up to date. So I just want to acknowledge that with the funds we've been given over the past few years, uh, we've been able to hire staff, we've been able to hire contractors, we've been able to have key benchmarking activities, uh, not only underway, but in a very robust way so that the groundwork, thanks to the investments that Council has made has really been laid for this program to continue. I also want to acknowledge that the executive's budget for this year really underscores equity in, in very meaningful ways, and building energy performance standards is another great example of um, equity being central to to the path forward here. So the proposed funding that you were describing, Council Member, will pay for um, will pay for or subsidize the cost of energy audits and under-resourced buildings. Um, to enable them to identify opportunities to increase their efficiency. So I just want to acknowledge that um, not only uh, is the amount and the path forward really important, but it really underscores the commitment to equity and the progress we've made in really meaningful ways going forward. Um, as you acknowledge, it is very much a huge undertaking, and we acknowledge that there's much, much, much more work to come. So um, we have uh, Stan Edwards, who runs the Climate Division here, who can speak in more detail to the path forward on the program, and we also have our Climate Change Officer as well. So why don't I, why don't I look down the dais here, and we can Great. elaborate. Mr. Edwards. Well, thank you. I'm Stan Edwards, uh, Chief of the Energy, Climate, and Compliance Division at DEP. Uh, as Director Monger talked about, we are – we've spent uh, – number of years focusing on moving BEPS forward. As you know, based on discussions we've had here at the committee, it's a long-term program. So buildings first figure out what they, where they stand now with respect to their energy use and then develop plans to improve their energy use to meet the BEPS standards. Right now we're focused on the, the first steps in that process, and that is getting buildings benchmarked, uh, understand the characteristics of their buildings, and getting energy audits, which helps them develop the foundation for the plan going forward. So this is another uh, uh, down payment, I guess, on that activity. We've been doing that uh, for a, a couple of years now, particularly partnering with the Green Bank, which supports a lot of that activity. Um, as Director Monger mentioned uh, at the Energy Summit yesterday, we had a lot of discussions about this, and a lot of entities talking about the support they got from the Green Bank and how that how valuable that is to them in understanding a path forward on BEPS. So, again, this is just another uh, another payment toward that uh, that support and depending on what the ultimate regulations will be um, different buildings will have to do different things so the the path isn't entirely clear at this point but we know that that a lot of buildings will have to do some some improvements and, and this this will get them started on that great Ms. Colbo Smucker I just want to underscore that um, as you're all well aware BEPS is one of the first biggest major initiatives of implementing the Climate Action Plan. And um, as Director Munger emphasized, as we are looking at how we're implementing the Climate Action Plan, of course, this payment isn't going to cover all the needs of under-resourced buildings, but it's important that as we're taking steps, we are ensuring that we are bringing um, under-resourced communities and um, the buildings that serve them along with us, and so putting in uh, as was said, a down payment I think is not only important in terms of this program, but in terms of our approach to the overall climate action plan. Thank you. Uh, and as has been mentioned a number of times, the Green Bank and the wonderful work that they do, uh, we'll be having a joint committee with the GEO committee uh, next week, I believe, uh, on, on the Green Bank's budget. Uh, but also just want to share for, for 
public awareness, uh, there have been a lot of conversations that I and the executive have been involved in regarding the Green Bank and using their bonding authority to help support this work. Uh, much like the county has bonded, uh, uh, has bonded uh, revenue to support uh, the building of affordable housing through the Housing Initiative Fund or, or the Housing Opportunity Fund, uh, there are deep conversations with the DEP, Green Bank, and the Department of Finance about bonding authority for the Green Bank in order to jumpstart this work. A lot of legal things to work through, but all of that, those conversations are taking place in anticipation of uh, a regulation being approved. Um, mm -hmm. I have a few other questions, but I'll turn it over to colleagues first. Council, Mem uh, Council Vice President Stewart. Um, well, I, I don't know if Council Member Bauck, sorry, I, I had a question on page six. <laughs> We're still all in, this, in the okay. first packet, so um, anything I, in the first packet, packet okay. is fair I game. Just, sorry, uh, just if we go back and forth. Um, I, I just wanted to clarify the transfer of the position to the Office of Grants Management um, on the climate grant, to increase climate grant capacity, because I think, if I'm remembering correctly, this was a position that we um, added last year from la from last year's, but no, it's not, no, okay. <laughs> then I'm misremembering. And I just, I wanna make sure that if we're transferring positions out into the Office of Grants Management that we're still focusing on grants on, around our climate work. So I just wanted to talk to, about that, yeah. Yeah, um, I can speak to that first in that, so when I, when I came in, um, sort of first order of business was to make sure that the county is as well poised as possible to seek the once in a generation opportunity yep. of the Inflation Reduction Act. And um, there's a number of things. So the fiscal year 24 budget funded two positions in right. DEP. Um, and DEP has, I believe, one filled in as well underway and the other, so that, that's fantastic. Um, but there's a lot of coordinating and centralized and needs um, to make sure that we're well poised that aren't necessarily housed in DEP. And so this is to more um, immediately repurpose and coordinate the county's efforts, um, assist other departments who, who may not have that in-house resource. Um, and so it's intended to, while not exclusively, because we want that flexibility, you know, if someone has downtime and they can jump in and help on a police grant, great. Um, but the position, you know, title, the posting, the description will be about focused um, primarily, though not exclusively, on climate grants. Um, and I think that it's a, it's intended to be a term position in acknowledgement that this is a once in a generation opportunity. We have this window of time. We need to resource up for it, and then. When the money's spent, um, you know we don't we don't know what comes next. So let's make sure we're we're resourced for this window of time. Okay. So that position is just going to be now in the Office of Grants Management. Correct. All right. Perfect. Okay. I just had. And, yeah. And and I think uh, what you're remembering yeah. is that this committee last year supporting right. the hiring of grants managers to go out and find funding, but I don't think our colleagues ultimately supported that. Is that? Yeah. Correct. Yeah, we had a number of climate-related yeah. items that right. made it to the end of the process but didn't quite get through the That's finish right. line. Great. Right. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for... There's a reason you chose not to remember it. Right. Because <laughs> well, we're going to correct this. Well, we position in for, right? Last year we got this, the, the position for the um, CCE uh, in, in the budget. So I had no. both of those things in my mind and, no. yeah. If I could clarify. Yeah. Yes. We, the two grants positions were approved. In DEP, we are in the process of filling those. See, I was right. Okay, we, we did not. <laughs> we did not get a, a community choice position. Uh, yeah, okay. We didn't request one. Uh, we all right, so that's what we didn't get. We're okay at that point. Thank no, you, Santa. I knew we got something. <laughs> we didn't request a CE. That didn't come over in the recommended budget. A, a position for CCE. C C C C We're not at the point where we need that yet. We'll okay. have more discussions about that going forward. But right. Um, the the. I just want to assure people that uh, again, we are filling the grants positions. But we are very focused on grants. We have staff that are spending an awful lot of time on, on chasing grants. So the fact that those positions aren't fully filled yet has not stopped us from going after every dollar we can find. Uh, my colleague, Lindsay Shaw, who's in the, in the, in the audience yeah. here, has, has devoted 24-7 almost working on grants. So uh, we're very focused on that. Great. All right. Well, 
my memory was the same as yours <laughs> <laughs> to begin this, but because uh, I remember we didn't get everything that this committee recommended right. in the budget last year, but I remember we got something, and so it was the the two grant positions. Okay, I'm good. Councilmember Balcom. Um, thank you. Uh, so from from the BEPS perspective. Um, so I, I'm really, uh, I think this is great, and I think it will be uh, very popular when, when um, building owners realize that they need to do this. And uh, the, some, for the most part, the vast majority of, of business owners, building owners, want to do the right thing. Uh, but very often they don't, they don't quite know how to do it. So I think that this is really important. And as with many other resources that the county has, the communication of availability is critical because we see it time and again that the, the people in the know get the resources. And so I think that it, we've had the same discussion when we talked about leaf blowers, right? So there are gonna be, this money will be gone before the people who need it the most even realize that it's available. So I think that that's just so critical when this uh, when this program gets up and running to to, 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 to do that. Mr. Edwards. So I can just say um, the program actually is up and running now. We are, mm -hmm. the Green Bank mm -hmm. is providing these services and has helped a number okay. of buildings with benchmark. What are the differences between this program? I think your, your mic microphone. just went off, Stan. Yeah. One of the, maybe someone, had, let me just stop talking. Maybe John <laughs> pushed the button. Yeah, that's right. I know. Um, one of the differences between this and the challenge of the leaf blower law, for example, where we're trying to communicate with hundreds of thousands of, of residents and and uh, many many businesses, is we know the regulated community of the mm -hmm. BEPS program, sure. and we're in communication with them. They have to they have to start all the the buildings that are covered. will have to have started benchmarking by this June, the last section of buildings which is the smaller uh, multifamily and smaller, a uh, smaller multifamily buildings, we'll have to, to, to uh, benchmark. And we've been communicating with them on a regular basis about that. We have lots of resources, as does the Green Bank, to help them. So I think the communication will be covered. Now, will they, will they all act at the same level? Probably not, but we'll continue to work with them to make sure they know the availability mm -hmm. of this. And, uh, and things like the, Green, uh, the uh, Energy Summit yesterday um, provide opportunities for people to hear from people who have gone through the experience of having the Green Bank support them in this work. And, uh, you know, we'd like, we, we will continue to have that, um, Lindsay and her team work uh, 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 quite a bit going out to various entities and having conversations with them, individual building owners or groups uh, representing building owners. So uh, we're, we're very aggressive on the outreach on that. I appreciate that. Thank you. And so, um, so you know the population that you're trying to reach. And uh, I agree with uh, Chair Glass that this doesn't seem like it, it's enough. So <clears throat> do you have a delta of, you know, seven to 12 audits versus how many people might be interested in support? Uh, don't know the exact number that might be interested. Again, we've, this program has been up and running. We've been providing funding to it. The Green Bank is using some of the energy tax resources to, to support this program as well. Um, I don't have the statistics at my fingertips on how many buildings they've worked with so far, um, but we will continue to invest in this. We're, we're right now going after a $20 million grant to supplement uh, under-resourced buildings related to BEPS. So again, that's another example of where we're trying to get funding in, which will en enable us to do many more buildings. But we'll, this will be something that will be an ongoing effort to continue to, to do outreach and, and go after funding okay. to support this. One final question on this. So, um, Mr. Lovchenko, why is this? If this if this is program has been going on, why are we considering this a new program? Well, not a new program. Not a new program, but it is. It's new or enhanced resources to an existing program. So it does show up in the executive's recommended budget as a as as new as that category, and it does fit the category of of. Uh, that we're looking at in terms of centralizing the council's review at the end. Um, is it part of a mandated program? Yes, uh, but there's not a mandate that the county provide these resources in this way. It's a choice that the county would make. Okay. Uh, so it is, it is considered a new slash enhanced effort. Okay, thank you. 
appreciate those questions. I just want to pick up a little bit more uh, regarding the grants. And, and Mr. Edwards, you mentioned a grant opportunity that's being sought for $20 million. Uh, what is, and I'm looking at Ms. Shaw, thank you for helping lead all of that work. Uh, what, what is that kind of return on investment? How many people do we have grant writing, searching, right, at federal, state, and other levels? And how much are we actually receiving? So that's a, a question we'd probably want to compile some data for you on. We have lots of people looking for grants and involved in applying for grants. Um, we've been successful on some, have not been successful on others. Um, and again, I, I don't know the total amount we've received and what we what we have in the pipeline. Okay. But uh, yeah, I, I think that's helpful because the entire reason that we were uh, strongly supporting the two grant writers last year was mm -hmm. recognizing an investment in personnel would yeah. turn into investments uh, in infrastructure and in, in other grant opportunities. So if there's any way to kind of quantify that, I think that would be insightful for us. Yeah. I, yeah. I think the one, one thing I would add is in terms of, obviously there's grants that aren't tied to the Inflation Reduction Act and bipartisan infrastructure law, but in terms of those, a lot of the major grant uh, you know, the, the agencies had this sort of time to develop it and put it out and have the guidance. So a lot of the major grant applications are, are just underway. So, um, you know, we, we just were able to join um, three coalitions on the EPA's um, uh, climate pollution reduction grant. Um, thanks uh, to a lot of partnership within the county, which was, is incredibly helpful. So we joined through the state. Um, for uh, a building energy performance um, implementation grant. We joined through the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments for residential decarbonization and municipal fleet and charging. And we joined through the state, through multi-state led by North Carolina on, on tree canopy. So that's something that's submitted. Um, and, you know, now fingers crossed, fingers crossed in, in yes. EPA's hands. So I, I think the, the question will have a lot more evidence. I also think we have to be, um, you know, we are, we are aggressively seeking grants and also joining coalitions. Um, and, and in part, I think we need, we need to be aware that there's, a very clear focus on investing in under-resourced communities um, in a lot of the Inflation Reduction Act funding, and we are going to make that case about how we will do that in our community. But it is, um, you know, these are competitive grants, and and there are going to be a lot of communities across the country, um, you know, who, who have cases to make as well. Right, Dr. Munger. Mr. Uh, agree completely. I think we will be able to give you more robust, objective information um, after some of the applications we've been actively working on have come back to us, as the climate change officer said. Mm -hmm. You know, I will acknowledge that um, we are already having some wins, which have been very public, and I know are public to all of you already. Where you know we don't know the exact number yet, but the Green Bank is a subawardee of a huge, huge, huge award um, from the US EPA Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. We anticipate that will translate into tens of millions of dollars coming into Montgomery County. So um, it's so we are already really seeing some of the benefits of a, a very coordinated county focus on grants, mm -hmm. um, but absolutely we'll we'll see more as we get as we get the applications back Perfect. in the coming months. Thank you. I, I just wanted, uh, Ms. Gogo Knucker mentioned the uh, climate pollution reduction grants. I just wanted to acknowledge your efforts, Councilmember Glass, and yours, Councilmember Stewart, on working with COG to encourage them to, uh, to, to develop the grant that they did develop. We know you had a, a, an important role in that. So thank yeah, you. That, that is uh, the shrouded mystery of sometimes how these grants work. <laughs> and Montgomery County is in a unique position where we are leading the way. I know it doesn't always seem that way, but when you use a baseline of where we are and what we're doing compared to other jurisdictions, we are far and away leading the way. And sometimes these grant applications, uh, there's a disconnect between what um, leaders want to do and what laggards want to do. And so uh, Council Vice President Stewart and I uh, had a meeting yeah. with the Council of Government's Executive Director to say we all need to be collaborative here and um, fingers crossed that this grant comes in. Um, last question on, on this particular item is regarding the $200,000 for the charging infrastructure. Can you um, provide some insights into that? Is that residential property, commercial property, government in facilities? 
Sure. Sam, do you want to respond? Yes, I want to respond by asking Ms. Shaw to come up to the table. She, <laughs> we're taking credit for all the good work that, uh, that she and her staff do, so she can provide more details on the, on the charging infrastructure. Good afternoon. Thank you. Sorry. I've been talked about and finally here. Um, so the $200,000 for the, uh, the EV infrastructure work um, is important for a lot of different reasons. One, we're seeing a lot of federal grants hit the street that require cost matching. We want to make sure that we have funds available for that to happen. Mm. Uh, we saw that Governor Moore had a huge announcement recently that I know that Sarah was at uh, that was focused on in putting funding in the state budget for climate. One of those areas of interest was in installing charging at multifamily properties. Mm -hmm. So we want to be able to have funding available to help support that statewide effort, particularly here in Montgomery County, um, and providing incentives to make sure that that installation happens. So it is a, it's a little bit flexible because sometimes these grant opportunities come up out of nowhere. Uh, we want to make sure that we're ready and able to hit the street with those. What I very much love and appreciate about that idea is these are flexible, uh, but they are I guess, as you noted, to be used for matching. So the opportunity, the, the actual dollars should be greater than this if everything works out, because I was going to say $200,000 on its own is not creating a vast infrastructure. Uh, but if it's a project by project basis or for something larger, um, I think that's great. Any other questions on this packet? I just want to thank the, uh, the team for the uh, EV charger uh, information. Uh, one of my staff was at the summit and, and just was really impressed by uh, the progress that was made. And we get the, comp we get the call, uh, calls a lot from a HOAs to say, how do we do this? How can we do this? Um, and so I think this will be very well received. So thank you. Yeah, Michelle. Um, thank you. Yes, Craig was at the, the event yesterday and we had a, a good chat. Um, I do want to highlight the fact that um, our staff, Brian Boer, in, on our team is just going after every opportunity imaginable and just released a really great resource about multifamily charging and HOA property. So you can find that on our website. Great. Can you share that with us so that we can pass that out? Great. Uh, so without objection, we'll yeah. support uh, all of the spending initiatives in this packet. If I could just um, add one push because yes. it didn't come up and I think we just already said emphasize. we support it so I'm curious how, <laughs> how much more you're asking um, for no 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 uh, the solar I just want to just have mentioned the solar yes. strategic plan position um, because uh, from my vantage point where a lot of it is a coordinating function, um, you know, the value of Brian Boer and the electric vehicle position is just invaluable because he's able to do that coordinating, convening, pulling resources together, putting resources out. And solar is such an essential part of the clean energy transition in the county and statewide. And having a position, a point person, I think that's just another position that's going to, you're going to see the benefit of it far extend just the investment in that position because the ability to have someone, you know, someone again at the summit just yesterday, someone came up to me and was like, well, I want to find out this about solar. And it wasn't something the county was doing, but had there been a good connector, it would, you know, would have been very easy to point them to that person and that person would know who to point them to. And I, I think that kind of position on something as essential as solar is really important. And then funding that position to do a strategic study so that they're using their time as effectively as possible um, is, is an important combination. So wanted to add that. Well, now I have a question, right? So, <laughs> uh, and, and you might not have the answer right now. Do you know what percentage of our uh, residences have solar attached to it? And and I guess to be even be more specific, single family homes, which are the uh, overwhelming majority of residences. It's a, it's, okay. a small, it's a small percentage, yeah. relatively small percentage. Um, I will say that the, the reason we think a solar position is so important is because the, our needs related to solar range from individual rooftop units to what do we do about large scale, uh, utility scale solar in the ag reserve, for example, there's a there's a uh, an application before the Public Service Commission right now for a four megawatt facility in the ag reserve, which you know, is going to be regulated by a state process. We can have input into that, right? But and it runs the gamut between that, those very small systems to the very large systems, mm -hmm. and just trying to figure out all the pieces, all the ways that the county could play a role in encouraging, influencing, incentivizing potentially. Uh, the development of solar on all those things. Right. Um, and, and right now we do not, we have a number of people in the in DP and DDS and, and DPS who have some 
uh, background and some involvement in solar, but we don't have a, a very comprehensive strategy about where are the, the real opportunities for us. And so that's what the, this position and the development of a plan would allow us to do, is to really have a playbook for how to move forward. Uh, I just want to underscore what you said about that uh, facility, the proposed facility uh, in the Ag Reserve that is uh, being managed through the state, and those are state applications and regulations, and the county is not uh, directly involved in that. So thank you. Great. So you have a committee recommendation to support all of these uh, new and enhanced projects. Uh, item number two. Yeah, let me just... I just just one other item while we're on the the general fund budget. Okay. Um, just for your interest, there is uh, I've noted some information on the Tree Montgomery program, which uh, the, the tree planting itself has a dedicated funding source, as I've noted in the packet, uh, from the Tree Canopy Conservation Account, which was established under Bill 3512. Uh, the reason I just bring this up today is the, the program has expanded over the last several years as the uh, the amount of tree planting has increased and the, and the uh, demand has increased. Uh, within this packet, uh, uh, we, we looked at items that um, might be of interest to the council for a more in-depth review. So staff does have some additional information on that in the packet uh, for the council's interest. We don't need to delve into that today, but you will, you will see in other department budgets as well what we call in-depth reviews where we take a program and we, we go a little bit deeper with it and include that information in the packet. Uh, but uh, just wanted to note that here while we're uh, on that discussion. And also the, the Tree Montgomery program also has some funding that's paid for out of the Water Quality Protection Fund, uh, items that are not eligible to use that tree canopy account. Uh, so it, it bridges the two budgets. Great. Uh, thank you for elevating that. Uh, so the second item on today's agenda is the climate change uh, planning NDA. Uh, and this is a proposed operating budget uh, for $718,000 uh, approximately, which is a $230,000 increase uh, from last year as a way to support the continued work of our climate action plan. And I know there's a lot of work in there regarding the EV charging stations and, and more grant uh, seeking and, and support uh, and some community uh, partnerships as well. So I'll turn it over to uh, staff to walk us through that. Yeah, this NDA originated when the, uh, the, the climate planning work was ongoing. And then once the, the, once the initial climate planning work on the, on the action plan was completed, it moved more into uh, looking at specific areas to implement some of those initiatives. And unlike DEP, which has programs that carry on from year to year, uh, this NDA may move from one subject to another. Uh, and we can certainly have the climate change planning officer here uh, speak to that. Uh, so I've tried to note what's occurring in FY24 in the budget and then some of the things expected in 25. Uh, the increase that's noted here uh, is for the, um, uh, let's see, I'm just trying to, right, the, um, uh, Climate communication and stakeholder and resident engagement uh, is about $230,000 requested. Um, uh, and we can talk more about that. Once again, as an ad slash enhancement, it would be going on the, the master list for a full council review. Uh, but I think it would be helpful to hear more today on that, on that item and also other things that uh, are happening in the NDA uh, in 24 and carrying over into 25. Let's do just that. Ms. Kovos, Smucker. Thank you. So um, I think the flexibility to be able to see where there's an immediate need, where there's a value add, and especially where um, some one-time spending can move a program forward is so important to keep the momentum going on implementation of the Climate Action Plan. Um, so I think the ability that we had to um, hire grant writers for some multi-department grants, you know, other grant writers come out of department's budgets and that should remain the case, <laughs> but there's times where it's, you know, really a multi-department effort and, and um, seeking unique climate funds. So the ability to do that was one important thing. Um, and in terms of the enhancement, when we've, we've heard, I've heard over and over again, both internally and externally, 
in terms of what's needed next, that the number of initiatives in the Climate Action Plan about public engagement, stakeholder engagement, public communication um, are, are happening, and, and there's a lot of great work out there, but need to be moved to that next level, and ideal, you know, through a consultant-led, um, uh, data-driven targeting, um, Campaign that involves stakeholder engagement and you know more sort of direct communication, um, professionalized communication, and the idea of that would be to um, have uh, research and, and recommendations, and then also doing a, a, a public communication campaign. Um, and ideally with a leave behind product, so it's not necessarily an ongoing expense, but you're having something that you can then bring in house and build on going forward. Great. Um, so uh, let's dive a little deeper in, into this work. It, it's been a little while since the committee has gotten an update on the Climate Action Plan because, quite frankly, we've been uh, spending a lot of our time talking about the environment with regard to all the regulations that we've been passing to move us forward, right? Uh, and we only have uh, so many uh, hours in the day. But uh, with regard to this and with regard to the work that, that the county executive has undertaken since day one, where are we in our own benchmarking of the Climate Action Plan? Um, I know that the original analyses were looking at uh, some of the easier things to do, and I think we've, we're moving up from that so it gets a little more difficult, a little more time intensive, a little more uh, resource required. And so share with us where we are. I mean, we, first of all, a lot of where we are is, is leadership of this committee, as, as you're all very well aware in terms of um, the complexity of supporting moving CCE forward, the importance of moving BEPS forward, the investments that have been made that we're able to do with, for example, the EV position and the EV purchasing co-op. Um, in terms of the Climate Action Plan as a whole, um, the, as you know, with the GHG benchmarking, we rely on Council of Governments, so we get numbers every two to three years. We, our latest numbers are the 2020 numbers, so we've had the, as I believe the packet notes, uh, around a 30 percent decrease to pipe, despite an increase in population since we started benchmarking in 2005. We, the next year that COG is benchmarking is 2023. We won't get that till 2025. Um, one of the measures in the Climate Action Plan is to develop interim metrics and then ideally a live dashboard. Um, some great, we've been looking, one of the Climate Fellows pulled some very good examples elsewhere that we've looked at. Um, for example, the County of San Diego is, does this. Um, and then we have a group of UMD students right now at the Smith um, Center. They are, they're business students who are making some recommendations. Ultimately, you know, we're, we're going to need more than that to, to get that done, but that's something that we're trying to move forward to have that live update on the interim metrics. But um, I think the climate plan is well underway. We've had completion or significant progress on a number of the actions, um, but there's a ways to go, and yeah. 2027 is quite soon. Okay. I'm glad to know about the, the COG update for 2025. I was unaware of that, so that, that's going to be helpful as we continue doing this work, and uh, it'll provide us with a new benchmark. Kyla, any questions? No? Yeah. <laughs> Famous last words. Um, just curious, the uh, pay as you throw, um, did you want, somebody want to oh. just brief on that? I think that's something that I'm. Oh, we were going to take that up as part of the um, uh, resource and re recycling oh. uh, management Sorry. budget. Thank you. So that is that is in that in that packet coming up. Now, uh, you you are correct that there's the Department of Corrections uh, food waste streams that's in here, but yeah, we'll pick that up. Uh, so again, that reminds me of another question. Uh, I see here that there is support for one of our uh, local uh, community-based organizations, uh, Impact Silver Spring. Can you elaborate as to what that partnership might entail? This has been an ongoing project um, at, De uh, at DEP. Doug Weisberger is the point person, um, and it is about um, exploring localized economic development and community development models to have more community resiliency. Um, I would 
need to. So I don't see Doug here. So yeah, yes. okay. <laughs> Um, but it, 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 it was funded in prior years through the climate NDA, and there's a continuation of the project. I don't know if um, Stan has more to say on that. Yeah, I can fill in a little bit more. Um, in the economic development study we did as part of the Climate Action Plan, they emphasized the importance of uh, retaining local businesses, and one of the ways you can do that is through worker-owned cooperatives. And so that's the project we've been working on with Impact Silver Spring, which was engaged in that activity uh, previously. Uh, to help uh, foster the development of worker-owned cooperatives. There were the, the analysis we did identified a lot of businesses that were at, the, uh, uh, small businesses were at the point where the owners were getting ready to retire or perhaps sell the business, likely based on the age of the business. And so to support, rather than that business being sold to a larger corporation or closing, to have workers uh, come together and, and and buy the business and become become a worker-owned cooperative. So that's what that effort's all about, trying to fund it. What is the link between cooperative business ownership and DEP? Uh, well, it's about it's about resiliency. So it's about climate resiliency, local jobs. Um, climate covers everything. We got into the business of looking at what are job opportunities as a result of climate work. And so we originally were focused on worker-owned cooperatives that were involved in the green space. Um, green jobs, and so that just was an outfall of that, or an outcropping of that particular work. Okay. We've gotten involved in, in things that I never thought we would get involved in, but as we've talked about well, many times, climate covers a lot of ground. So uh, Absolutely, and I've done work with uh, Impact Silver Spring specifically because uh, over the last number of years they've wanted to uh, uh, increase their food resiliency. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there were a number of properties around the county that were owned by DOT, namely, or some other agencies that were just vacant, you know, vacant parcels. Uh, and we worked with them to be able to get some MOU or some leasing so that they could then turn that into a community garden, right? So I totally understand that. I'm, I would request to get more information about the types of jobs that you're referring to, uh, just so that we, we make sure that uh, there is a relationship between uh, the resiliency DO, uh, department uh, of DEP uh, and the work that they're doing. We'd be happy to. Great, thank you. Uh, so, uh, without objection, we'll support uh, all of these items as well. So, now we're moving over to agenda item number three, which is the Water Quality Protection Fund, uh, which is a $36 million proposal, an increase of 2.1 million dollars and two new positions. Thank you, Ms. Shaw. Thank you, Mr. Edwards, Ms. Colwell Smucker. Um, water Protection Fund uh, pays for the county's work to comply with our MS4 permits, which we've, we've spent a considerable amount of time, particularly within the CIP, talking about this year. Uh, and it's a five-year permit that is required by the state and federal government uh, to help us manage over 1,800 impervious surfaces. Um, I'll say before we just get into this that this committee um, during the CIP conversation says we need to look more upstream, right? Uh, and that the stream restorations uh, uh, which have taken place, uh, which have occupied most of the work, um, we want to we want to see more in the neighborhoods, in the communities trying to capture and divert the water before it reaches our streams. Uh, I know that message has been heard, but important to state uh, at the top of this conversation. Uh, and uh, Mr. Lovchenko, you want to add your thoughts? Um, sure. Um, uh, first, I, I did want to sort of highlight as a, as a separate enterprise fund unto itself, uh, the revenue sources are very important to understand here. Um, most of the revenue coming into this fund is through the water quality protection charge, uh, which is an assessment on a property tax bill. Uh, it's a charge that the council approves every year by resolution. Uh, you did hear some um, interesting public hearing testimony, which I wanted to note, uh, suggesting some changes to the structure of how uh, the charge is assessed to uh, property owners. Uh, and I, I suggested in the pack that is something we could take up after budget. It would require either a regulatory change or perhaps law change, depending on how um, significant the, the structural change is. Uh, but there is the potential that if you do that, you, you could 
you could raise additional revenue through that. So that was the intent of the, the public hearing testimony was to try to find a way to raise more revenue to do more work. Uh, so that's something the committee can look up, look at after budget. Uh, the other, another significant revenue source is the bag tax. Uh, that raises about 2.5 million a year or so, and it is important for people to know that is dedicated in, to the water quality protection fund. So those those resources go towards those efforts in that fund. Uh, so it's not a general fund uh, revenue source, uh, and uh, there there are some. Um, there, there is one of the recommendations in, in the budget is to do some increased uh, uh, outreach regarding the bag tax, uh, and that's in response to some concerns raised in an inspector general report regarding the implementation of, of the bag tax uh, across retailers, and, and um, uh, we can get into that uh, later as well. But uh, I, I did want to note those are, the, those are two of the key revenue sources in this fund. Uh, that uh, you know drive the um, uh, the resources available. Director Munger, anything else you want to add on this item? I, we have questions, I know, but turn it over to you in case you have anything else you want to add. Sure, sure. thank thank you, Council Member. I, I'll just add uh, going back to Mr. Levchenko's mentioning earlier of the score that the department received. On, on our equity and budget tool rating of an eight, which we're proud of, but we're also always working to improve. I think there's some terrific examples in the water space of how the department is continues to center equity in our work. And I just wanted, because sometimes a number speaks much much more than, than, than words um, in this, in our Clean Water Montgomery grants, over 32% of the outgoing grants were awarded were issued for projects in areas with 80th percentile or higher on the Environmental Justice Index. Um, we also make sure that projects are not only located in areas where uh, equity considerations are prominent, but that they include and engage the full extent of communities where the projects are located. And we've also been ensuring that the Tree Montgomery program, um, also administered in WRD, uh, is using grant money received to make sure trees are being planted at schools and equity areas throughout the county. So um, a lot of this work uh, in this area is very, uh, at the risk of stating the obvious, very physical. These are intensive projects, but they also have meaningful impacts for the affected communities. And so equity is a really, really important part of this work, and it's a really important part of the department's focus. Uh, th th thank you for lifting that up, because I'll, I'll, I'll pull the word. Um, I'll, I'll use the word equity, um, which is incredibly important in the way that you, you mentioned it. Uh, but with regard to the bag tax, as Mr. Lovchenko mentioned, um, it appears that the bag tax has not been applied or the revenue from the fees have not been received equitably throughout the county. And that is a, uh, that was the determination of the Inspector General report, which has been alluded to. And it was uh, that Inspector General report and the conversation thereafter was uh, the first time that uh, this body, under the leadership of the, the GEO Committee Chair, uh, Vice President Stewart, member of the T&E Committee, um, uh, worked with the T&E Committee to, to have that oversight hearing. And so I want to, I don't know who can best talk about the, the bag tax, but I think now would be a good time to jump back into that to see what lessons have been learned, how much uh, outreach has been done. Quite frankly, I'll, I'll, I'll say it now, whether or not we need to hire somebody or use $100,000 to implement or to do outreach for something that people should be complying with. And I'll, I'll, I'll end by saying whether or not we should even be allowing the use of plastic bags to be sold. And every time I raise that issue about just prohibiting bags, plastic bags in the first place, uh, it's usually it's usually the department that comes back or others who say, well, we get two point five million dollars from the sale, and that is reinvested in our environmental protection. So there's a lot. Can you unpack all of that? Mm -hmm. Yes, very bad. I apologize. We can certainly try. I'm going to look uh, down the dais here uh, to Mr. Edwards, um, as as well as Amy Stevens, who can talk more about the program. Um, I'll I'll just acknowledge that the county. Uh, the county's trajectory on this issue uh, continues to evolve. It's, we were a leader in the space when the tax, uh, when we came out with the tax uh, over a decade ago. But um, that's not to say that's 
that's necessarily where we should be today. So I think we're certainly open to cons considering ways to continue to improve the program, and it's certainly it's certainly one that we've that we've worked on a lot. Um, so why don't I turn it over to Stan um, to talk a little bit about um, how we've been enforcing and developing the program. Yeah, you mentioned we added a staff member uh, as a result of the, the report that was done. Um, that staff member did a very extensive and aggressive outreach campaign. That's the first thing he launched when he came on board. His name is Johnny Bruno. He's been very effective at reaching out to businesses. So we, we for, the first thing we had to do was identify the regulated community. Uh, you'd think we would know all the retailers that would be subjected to this, and that turned out to be a surprisingly difficult exercise to go through. But as we have learned on the Economic Development Committee, there yeah. is no list of all the businesses in Montgomery County. Right. So, so he spent a lot of time doing that, working with various partners throughout the county and at the state level. Um, we got a good list. Um, we've done outreach to those uh, businesses, multiple languages, um, and he spent a lot of time following up with businesses. Um, to make sure they uh, understand what the parameters of the law are, how to get read, first of all, how to get registered in the system as a retailer who has to file the bag tax. And then are you filing for bag taxes as you should do according to the current parameters of the law? Um, I would say we're probably still in the learning mode, still, still trying to figure things out. We have provided some thoughts on the, on potential legislation to change the way the bag law works, what the fees might be, what, what materials could or couldn't be used. Um, and we're, we'll continue to engage in those discussions. So, um, yeah. And I'll turn it over to colleagues, but I'll just add this one more point. Uh, I've there there are always conversations about the amount of money that's generated from the bag tax, or in this case, the, the lack thereof, right, for retailers who are not providing. And people continue to be astonished that we bring in you know two and a half million dollars or so, a number that has only increased in time, which to me means five cents does not deter anybody. And so we, there's two ways to, to do this. Either we increase the fee to actually make it a deterrent, or we ban them entirely. And then we have a secondary conversation about how we make up that $2.5 million. Uh, but the, the environment clearly uh, would support some of those actions. So I'll turn it over to colleagues. Yeah. Great. Um. So I want to say uh, thank you to Stan and uh, DEP. So these are conversations uh, we've been engaging in, uh, and Mr. Bruno is doing an excellent job. Um, I just, I really appreciate uh, the feedback he's given. And uh, Mr. Lanchenkov, I know you had a list of things we need to come back to after the budget, mm -hmm. and I would say this is exactly the topic we need to come back to because yep. when we tie um, changing behavior and a fee to then also a fund in which we're using it to do things we when we actually start seeing like either it doesn't work or we want to move further uh, because we were a leader on this issue we are no longer a leader in this region on this issue um, on uh, the use of plastic bags and I think we need to be come a leader again here or at least come on par with um, the uh, municipalities and jurisdictions in our region and so uh, but it's a bigger question because this also is tied to how we put money into this fund is also tied to our AAA bond rating and how our bonding agencies review us. So it's actually complicated to uh, <laughs> once you start um, pulling one thread here. Um, and, but, uh, the back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so I think there's moving pieces um, to this. Um, and I think while we have it and we have Mr. Bruno doing this outreach, I want to make sure he has the tools needed um, to be able to do it. I think the foundation he is laying uh, will enable us to do better outreach regardless of what avenue we decide to go down um, in the future. Um, so I, I think that this is uh, good for the moment, uh, but ask Mr. Lachenko if we can add to that list he is creating for us um, revisiting this. Um, thank you. Uh, so it's always good to have the chair of the GO committee sitting right next to you <laughs> when we start to discussing revenues. Uh, because what I wanted to say was this program uh, was established uh, as a deterrent to eliminate uh, plastic bags, not as a revenue generator. Mm -hmm. And so we just have to keep that in mind as we as we move forward and what is the best way to move forward on that. Um, in terms of the uh, the budget request, 
the outreach, and I appreciate uh, Chair Glass's point of, um, you know, how much outreach do we need when, when it, they have people have to comply to it, to, to this anyway. So I would I would just say, and I, and I think the issue of outreach to businesses um, is important and has to continue because we're not reaching everybody that we need to reach. But I would question the outreach to residents in that, you know, so what is the balance of, of that outreach? I fully support continued outreach to businesses. I think that outreach to residents, um, they will, if we can get all the businesses in compliance, the, the residents will know about it as, you know, the first time that they're in a store that they're normally um, get a, pla a plastic bag for free. So I think there's, I think that the, for me, the balance should be on outreach to businesses, so. Yeah, I think you're hearing the same thing from all three of us, and it's just questioning where this program moves forward, right? Recognizing we were once a leader, now we are not. Going back to that general theme, right? And so if we find ourselves not leading, we, we, we need to step up. And using tax or, or using funds to uh, have people comply with what the law already is when those funds should be used to another goal mm -hmm. uh, makes it all very confusing. Add the bond rating into it, it makes it wholly confusing. And so let's let's have a post-budget conversation on this as well. Yeah, Ms. Stevens. Yeah, I just wanted to um, first uh, um, agree with the idea that we need to do more outreach to our businesses um, on the bag tax, and that is partly what this is meant to do, is complement all that work. But for residents, the focus is um, more on making accessible to them reusable bags mm -hmm. and providing that for those that need those reusable bags or don't have them. Um, we already do some of it, but we really need to step it up. And so it's not really, it's, it's really meant to say, if you need a reusable bags, here, we're gonna provide you with them so that you can keep remembering to bring these um, bags and provide our underserved marginalized communities with that firsthand so they don't have to pay it. Um, that's really what that was targeted to. Also, providing it in multiple languages, which is another um, key thing that we need to focus on always doing, especially with our transient population. We have so many languages spoke here. We wanna make sure that everybody has the information. Um, and right now, most of it is only in English, some Spanish, we need to do more. So that's really what that's targeted for. Um, thank you, I appreciate that. I appreciate that clarification and agree with you on that. If I could just point out one other thing about on the enforcement side, what, what Johnny, uh, Mr. Bruno has found in many cases is smaller businesses in particular don't want to fight with a customer mm -hmm. about the bag fee. You know, that, that puts them in a very uncomfortable position. And so the more residents know about the bag fee, you know, maybe we can diffuse some of those confrontations that actually happen at the, at the retail point. Uh, so he, he, he spent a lot of time talking to businesses about the law, and they've come back to him and said, well, I understand the law, but can I pay the, some have said, can I pay the tax? Because I would avoid paying, I would prefer to pay the tax myself than get into a confrontation with a customer. It's a valuable part of my business. So uh, just putting that out there as an additional thought. Uh, that, that is an interesting thought. I, I'd like to meet some of those people who raise their hand to, to pay higher taxes in, in some respect. I understand the logic there, but I think what we're all getting at is there are problems with this process and we need to revisit it. And uh, if people are getting into to arguments uh, about it, then that's something absolutely to consider and let's uh, alleviate uh, that tension one way or the other. So. Uh, good. We're good? Yeah. So we are, uh, without objection, we'll support everything in this uh, agenda item number three, uh, which is the Water Quality Protection Fund. Yeah. Um, I did have one, one uh, point I forgot to mention earlier. Okay. I mentioned the ERU rate that the council approves by resolution. Mm -hmm. The executive recommendation based on this budget assumes to increase that from $126 per year, the rate, I'm talking the ERU rate, mm -hmm. to $136.50 per year. So that is what most single family homes pay, but there is a seven tier structure. Uh, and so depending on which, which tier you fall in, you pay a, um, a uh, uh, multiple of that or a, uh, a divider of that sure. rate. Um, but the, the council approves the rate every year. And so I just wanna make clear that that would be going up. And um, in the fiscal plan, it does show that steady increases over the six year period. Uh, and um, 
a lot of that is driven by actually by debt service because mm -hmm. there's a lot of capital work that's assumed to move forward. You may recall we discussed the uh, flood management plan and the implementation of that. There's some very significant dollars in the CIP, and those are paid for out of this fund. Uh, so that is that is putting some pressure on the ERU rate uh, in the out years of the fiscal plan. Just wanted to make make you aware of that. Thank you for raising that. Uh, so item number four uh, is the FY25 operating budget for the Department of Environmental Protection, Recycling, and Resource Management Division and the FY25 solid waste charges. Thank you, Ms. Stevens and Mr. Edwards. Um, you know, every year we send about 600,000 tons of waste to the transfer station. Uh, that is the gravity of what we are talking about and why this investment and this commitment is, is so important. And so this year the county executive is proposing a $154.86 million towards uh, waste management, recycling and waste management, which is an increase of 12 point two million dollars and before I turn it over uh, to Mr. Lubchenko I will say that uh, two weeks ago I was walking my dogs in the morning and I saw uh, about three or four people in vests, vests, uh, fluorescent vests, uh, looking through some trash in my neighbor's uh, trash uh, and I went over and, and I said hey what are y'all doing and they said we're with, we're, we're with um, DEP and we're checking the recycling in your neighborhood I was like, that's great. Mm. Um, you know, there were a few other nefarious thoughts that, that <laughs> yeah, it wasn't my trash they were going through. Um, that would have been alarming. But, uh, and, and on a number, you might be next. And, and uneventful, I will say. Uh, very uneventful, boring. Um, but uh, I thank them uh, and that they were just trying to make sure that, you know, everyone was complying and, and also that the waste bins were. Uh, we're in good shape. Mine were not. I've had conversations with DEP. Uh, some of our contractors are a little rough in the morning, uh, and so we need to make sure they're, they're kinder to our recycling bins so that we can use them longer. Uh, but just wanted to give a shout out to everybody uh, who does that work. So, Mr. Wilchenko. Sure. Uh, yeah, th in this budget, uh, just structurally, there are two funds associated with it the collection fund, uh, which uh, deals with the refuse collection. Um, in subdistrict A, basically, uh, and then you have the solid waste disposal fund, which pretty much deals with everything else, uh, and is the far larger of the two funds. Both are enterprise funds supported by uh, solid waste charges, and I've, I've, we can go into the charges as well in a minute. Um, there's just a quick summary with regard to the collection fund. Uh, as as We've seen the last several years not a lot of change there other than increases in contract costs, and those are happening for several reasons. Uh, uh, you have um, new contracts that come into place uh, that are structured a little bit differently than the older contracts. We could talk about that. CPI increases for existing contracts, increases in house counts, things like that, uh, that increase the, um, uh, the collection contract costs. Um, uh, other than that, there's not a lot happening in the, in the collection fund. A lot of what we talk about regularly with, with solid waste tends to be more so on the disposal fund side of things. And there is a, uh, a significant new um, uh, addition requested this year for, to increase their, um, uh, sol their zero waste program and, and project management, about $3 million, and that's, that's a cutting across a number of different subject areas that we've, we've already alluded to, and I'll, I'll let the department talk more about that. And then there's a lot of other um, more typical technical adjustments that we have, uh, such as in the cost for the resource recovery facility, which I've, I've detailed in the packet. Uh, uh, the residential recycling collection program also has its contract costs, which are countywide, and those costs tend to go up for similar reasons to the, um, to the refuse collection contracts. Um, uh, you've got debt service um, as well and things like that in the fund. Um, it, with regard to the charges, uh, real quickly, I've noted, um, and, and these, are, these are charges the council approves by resolution every year. Uh, looking at the um, single family sector, the increases when you look across the different um, services that are provided for the uh, different homes, you're looking at an increase between 3.1 and 6%. 
And then for multifamily, it's about 4.8 to 6 percent. Uh, and then at the non-residential level, and this, this gets into the, how costs are allocated, uh, there's not much of an increase at all at the non-residential level this time around. We can talk about why that is. Um, and then there's no changes recommended in the transfer station tipping fees. Uh, there were some increases put in place last year, and uh, we could talk about that. Um, but I, I think the, the uh, main issue to talk about today really is the uh, DEP's uh, movement in this, the zero waste program and all the elements of that. Uh, and that does cut across a lot of the areas of interest to the committee. Uh, and we, of course, have a lot of overarching issues uh, moving forward in terms of um, uh, food waste and uh, capturing that and building capacity for that. We'll talk about that more with regard to the capital project in this sure. next item. Sure. Uh, and then also, ultimately, the um, disposal of our waste and whether it will continue to be the resource recovery facility or some other alternative that the executive is exploring. The budget this year is not looking at those kinds of dramatic changes. It's looking at uh, more incremental this year. Uh, but I, I, I do think the, um, the zero waste program is, is an exciting program that will uh, um, cut across a number of areas of interest to the committee. And so I suggest we, we delve into that. Uh, absolutely. I know uh, Councilmember Balcom already teed up. She has questions, mm -hmm. but before uh, I, I yield to her, uh, Director Munger, Mr. Weiner, uh, do you want to share what the progress that we're being made that's being made in the vision with, with within this budgetary item where we're going? Sure, I'm happy happy to happy to speak to that council member. And again, I want to thank uh, both uh, the three of you as well as as well as council staff for being supportive of this program. And and want to acknowledge that um, uh, the the scope of work, as you saw the other day while you were out walking your dogs, council member, uh, that DEP does every single day across the county is is truly truly impressive and uh, one of the key pieces that. Uh, remains a focus for us moving forward as we think about ways we can continue to improve and modernize our system is keeping as a North Star our continuity of truly exceptional services to everyone who lives and works in this county um, when it comes to the types of the way we handle our recycling and our waste services. So we're really proud of that record. Um, we get uh, single-digit uh, concerns and complaints raised on a given week for over 220,000 homes collected from. So uh, there's a lot to be proud of in our existing portfolio, and we're also really excited about the improvements we're going to make uh, towards it and that are underway. So, but I just want to acknowledge um, uh, under under uh, the team's terrific ongoing work that the services that the people who live and work in this county have come to expect are really something to be proud of. Uh, as, as far as the focus of the work moving forward, um, we are currently uh, undertaking analysis of the types of ways we can continue to modernize and improve that system. So um, as I think, as we've talked about uh, indi individually and collectively, and uh, we talk a lot of trash at DEP, and uh, rest assured we'll be talking That's more. That's almost as bad as my pun. We'll, so. be, t we'll be talking trash going forward, too. So <laughs> lots of trash talk uh, coming your way. Um, uh, is that uh, you know we want to be a leader not only in the state and and region but in the nation on this and um, there's really the the good news is is there's really good examples out there of the types of technologies and the types of systems that exist elsewhere in the country that we can learn from so uh, what we are in the process of undertaking now and and what you'll see reflected in this budget request is resources to do just that so um, we have a process underway now to uh, help determine what types of technologies exist elsewhere and how we can bring them here to Montgomery County if, if, if we decide to, to go down that road. And the good news is, is there's a lot of opportunity, but a consistent theme you'll see across the DEP portfolio is there's also significant challenges of implementing them in our current system, again, doing so in a way where services remain completely uninterrupted so that people uh, who are used to having their trash and recycling services picked up reliably wouldn't even know that some of the back end changes necessarily might be being made so um, and in ways where there will be more customer facing impacts that those are obviously fully explained and and that there's a big education curriculum that accompanies this because what we've seen uh, just from our initial survey is that 
And as you know, we have a very robust education and outreach program already for DEP that we're really, uh, really proud of. But um, we want to make sure that as these types of changes are considered, that there's accompanying outreach and education that, that goes along with them. So. Um, so uh, you referenced the types of numbers that go across uh, the tipping floor at the transfer station council member. And I, I think when we talk about aiming for zero waste, something we want to consider is that, you know, we really, uh, we really want to make sure that we are keeping things out of the waste stream that, that have a higher use. Um, as Willie Weiner, who does a terrific job running the division, can elaborate on, the county has created markets. Uh, we sustain and support markets. We make money selling these products. Um, so that's something that is very much uh, front and center as we think about the return on the investment for future technologies. I also want to acknowledge um, that uh, we also do a lot of good with materials that are turned in here in the county. So we want to make sure we're, we're keeping those in place now. So we're, we've continued to really expand programs that do good in the state and around the world. So we collect durable medical equipment, for example. So things like wheelchairs, canes, uh, that people might only need for a limited amount of time. We collect those. We have a partnership with the Maryland Department of Aging. If they need to be refurbished, those materials are refurbished, and they're given to our neighbors in need. Um, bikes, construction equipment, paint. We have partnerships with nonprofits that send those materials abroad um, so that uh, those in need can receive those. So things turned in right here in Montgomery County that people no longer need or want. Our goal is keeping them out of the trash. Um, and so what we have underway and what the zero waste uh, project and portfolio really supports is is really doing a systematic and, and comprehensive assessment of the types of technologies and programs that, that we should be thinking about bringing here to Montgomery County. And so that's exactly what we're, what we're looking to do. And i um, happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. I'll turn it over to Councilmember Balcom. Sure, thank you. Um, so my, my, uh, my prep scrib scribbles, uh, my shorthand failed me on this one, but I just want to, I, I would prefer to say that I was just so excited about talking to trash, so, um, so thank you. I don't blame I, you, Council. Right. <laughs> uh, just, I just want to make a couple notes first. Um, the education program, I, I think it's really great. So many of us are out in commu at community events all the time, and you, your team is always represented. And so I really appreciate that. There's a very uh, visible presence of how to recycle and just the support, so I appreciate that. Um, and then also looking at other jurisdictions, uh, and uh, is especially with technology. So we've been doing this for a long time, which is wonderful and great but we may not have the, the most up-to-date technology and the most efficient way to do, do things. So I think that looking at other jurisdictions which may have, a, have adopted practices later, they may be ahead of the game because of technology. So um, that, and I think the whole goal of uh, reducing materials in the waste stream is, is what it's all about, and um, we'll talk about that when we get to the organics. Um, so, so now, can you just tell me a little about about the uh, save as you throw, as pay as you throw, and where you think we should be going with that? Sure. Thanks for the question. And um, so, this is something that the the county is very very actively considering um, as a way we can potentially help incentivize um, and and realize benefits from changes in behavior. So, I alluded to this earlier in my response. Um, uh, so the, the short answer is it's something we're still very much actively considering, um, and there's a lot of there's a lot of there's a lot of considerations involved. So um, we don't have a plan to bring forward yet. It's something we're in the process of developing on, and happy to come back to you with more information um, as that gets further down the road, which we hope will be in the in the coming months. Um, I will say that uh, you and you mentioned this with respect, to Council Member, when we think about how we prioritize education and outreach is that you know when we're dealing with consumer behavior, it's it's not a, uh, it needs to be very much an integrated part of our entire strategy. Um, these aren't programs that are self-implementing. These are programs that take a lot of thought and intention about how we how we incentivize people to, to think and act differently with respect to their, their daily routines. Um, so, so Save As You Throw is something we are, are very much actively considering and we hope will be a, 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 and expect will be an integrate part of our integrated strategy to help change behavior. Um, we are considering uh, 
considering it in a way that will allow us to learn as we go so that we're not necessarily waiting to to sort of do everything later at the end but and that we've done this in other aspects of how we handle our programs and in, in the recycling and and resource management division where we really want to make sure we're um, developing the program in a way so that we can collect data along the way um, as we proceed which will allow us to then inform the larger program design so I'm, ha I'm happy to come back once the analysis is further along the way but we really do think it's a it's a potentially very promising part of our program and could be very helpful in in helping us realize some of the benefits of, con of consumer behavior change thank you I appreciate that and um, the communication with the with all the council members um, is important because um, as this moves forward and I'm very excited about the possibility of it I think that that's we need to change behavior and we need to look at all the ways that we can do that uh, but I know that uh, in terms of being on the front lines our phones will ring so I uh, appreciate the communication and coordination with our offices Thanks. absolutely and yeah, two quick points about save as you throw as well that we have to consider later as they move forward. One is the solid waste charges are not structured in that way, so that that's something that would have to be looked at. And then also we do have two sub-districts, so the county has a lot more control in sub-district A where it does uh, trash collection, much less control in sub-district B where that is uh, handled by uh, property owners and HOAs. Uh, so that's another uh, issue that cuts across some of these different initiatives that we may be looking at. Councilman um, Rostert. I just want to say thank you uh, to the department and director Monger and it's uh, for all the programs that we're doing to keep waste out of uh, the waste stream because um, it wasn't until we were both halfway around the world together that I actually learned about the painting uh, recycling program and other things that the department is doing so I'm you know I want to thank you thank everyone for the work that they're doing um, on this and then um, my other questions are on the organics processing but we're yeah, so hold on okay. yeah we'll, hold. we'll get to that in just a minute uh, I, I you know so a few weeks ago um, my husband and I went to the transfer station uh, we were doing yard work right tis the season uh, and if you think that Costco is busy on a Saturday mm -hmm. afternoon okay. go to the transfer station yeah. Um, I, I will say that we can improve the signage a little bit more. Um, so, uh, point of personal privilege <laughs> there. Um, I speak for my husband there. He was driving. Uh, but a uh, lot, of, lot of good stuff with the paint. I actually heard an NPR story um, very recently. Uh, I think about 10% of paint is unused, and where do you put that? And so lots of uh, different science and other things that are being done to try and uh, minimize that. Uh, but going back to um, my, my, uh, the DEP and, and the waste management collection, uh, there are some neighbors in North Four Corners in the Woodmore area who have been reaching out to Councilmember Mink and myself uh, about contractors who they have seen in a commercial property dumping both the recycling and the waste into the same uh, co collection bin. Uh, and so we can follow up after. Um, I'm not sure how prevalent this is. I hope it's not prevalent. Uh, I hope that our contractors are uh, doing two dual streams or, or whatever the terminology might be, but I'll, I'll follow up with you, uh, whomever that might be. Uh, neighbors have been contacting us. So with that, uh, we are good with this. We look forward to having more conversations uh, about the, you prefer save as you throw, right? That's the terminology. You yes. Save as you throw, not pay as you throw. Uh, and so, sorry. Uh, <laughs> we, we know which one will be will be used more often, yes. Uh, but we'll have more conversations. Think of it as saving our environment. Saving, well, all, all of this is saving our, our environment. That's why we are all very supportive of these efforts, but we'll have more conversations about that. Um, are there, are you going to come to us and have a conversation before anything is implemented or uh, with regard to that program? I know that there was that feasibility study that came out last year. Yeah, we're yeah we're happy to loop back with more information as yeah. the analysis proceeds. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Uh, thank you, thank you to everybody on this item and the last item on this afternoon's agenda. Uh, continuing the the waste management conversation. This is a 
CIP uh, item for FY25 to FY23 recycling and resource management for a new organics processing facility, uh, which is uh, very exciting uh, and would allow us to do more composting here in our own county as we have continued to start and expand composting. Uh, it started, I know, in uh, Silver Spring in Potomac and has only grown more. We'll learn more about that, but our ability to remove organics from the waste stream uh, is inhibited by our ability to put them places, uh, and we don't want to keep going to other jurisdictions to do that work. So, uh, Mr. Lovchenko, anything else you want to add? Uh, yeah, just uh, we've had a lot of discussions about food waste. It is, it is the um, uh, obvious next uh, source of waste to try to divert from the waste stream. Uh, DEP is already doing a lot uh, in areas such as backyard composting and encouraging that. Uh, commercial uh, food waste composting, they have a program where they help companies um, develop a capacity to do that and help them um, uh, get that waste to currently typically to the, the Prince George's uh, um, receiving facility. Uh, and then those companies graduate from the program and they can bring in more companies. But this is all fairly small scale relatively compared to what a curbside collection program might bring in, where we might be looking at 100,000 tons of material. And that kind of uh, capacity we just don't have right now. Uh, and uh, so DEP has been doing a lot of work uh, identifying uh, how that capacity could be created. Uh, and uh, uh, the, um, a couple of options that have come up in, in some consulting work they've done uh, includes the existing composting facility in Dickerson, which currently composts food, I mean, uh, yard trim exclusively, but could be converted to, to uh, uh, handle both. Um, and also the uh, Site 2 facility, it's a, it's a landfill uh, reserved site not too far from the compost facility. Uh, that would have uh, space uh, all as a as a reserve landfill site, but also perhaps as this type of site. And then the third site that was looked at um, is the transfer station itself. Uh, as you mentioned, Mr. Glass, there's a lot going on there already, so it would probably need to have an expansion uh, onto some existing land nearby. Um, once you start talking about acquiring land, that becomes a lot more difficult. Uh, DEP has looked uh, and had had the consultant look at potential other sites. Uh, that has not turned up a whole lot of opportunities. Uh, another option is out of county, uh, like we do with Prince George's or other facilities, so that's also an option. And then, of course, um, uh, more um, uh, non-point source, if you will, um, farmland and, and other areas where you try to distribute it more. But I think the, the, um, the option that has risen to the top really is the Dickerson composting facility. Uh, however, we do have um, some limiting factors there, including a, a legal agreement with the Sugarloaf Citizens Association, uh, which DEP is, uh, has opened up some discussions with uh, to see if they can come to some agreement there uh, with regard to that. Uh, in the meantime, they do have, they're continuing their research on this issue. Uh, with regard to the project itself, uh, it is a $28 million project. The, the construction money in it is really placeholder money at this point. Uh, they have some assumptions about what they would do, uh, but uh, it is based on a, um, a preliminary assessment of what it would what it would be to do it at the Dickerson facility. Uh, it would be somewhat different, obviously, if it was elsewhere. Uh, and as I said, we're not quite ready yet to move forward with you know with you know putting in uh, a, a construction schedule because we don't even know where the site's going to be yet. Uh, staff had suggested in the report that we wait for those uh, negotiations to conclude to see if we can nail down where the site is going to be uh, for this facility before putting in the project. Uh, DEP has, has noted that they, they have some ongoing planning work uh, and generic design work that they would like to do. Uh, and it does make sense, I think, to, to do that in a capital project context. Uh, so staff is supportive of that type of project moving forward. Uh, and can work with DEP to modify what's before you today that might fit more uh, that conceptual project as opposed to a, uh, a project with um, a uh, more defined scope that this is at the moment. So staff is suggesting that we, um, uh, that the committee consider approving a project uh, or consider supporting approval of a project, but that we have a little more work with DEP to um, 
uh, put it more in the, still more in the planning and design context uh, and come back later once we have a little more firm knowledge of what it's actually going to be. Sure. Uh, thank you for that backgrounder. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, hear from DEP about the vision and, and the work that needs to be done there and then turn it over to the district council member for, for first thoughts. So, Director Munger. Sure. Thank you. And uh, thank you all and to council staff, Mr. Lipchenko, for, for the conversations on this important topic. Uh, it, there are there's a saying around DEP that the future is about food mm -hmm. and uh, you know I think a lot of times when we talk about environmental issues with the public you know sometimes people don't know where to begin and I always tell people to look in their own kitchen as a starting place and think about how you make dinner what type of food you shop for um, what types of portion sizes you're using and of course where where it all ends up because that's what this is really about. So um, this is not a new issue for the county. We know this is a huge, huge, huge issue going forward um, with significant environmental impacts. It's a significant portion of our current waste stream. So um, we, we know this is one of the really key aspects of what, our, of what, of what reducing our waste looks like. Um, as Mr. Levchenko indicated, we do not have a dedicated facility in the county right now, uh, which is really limiting the ability of us to expand our existing program Programs. Um, so we see this as a very important part of our strategy going forward um, and, are, and are really eager to, to make sure that uh, planning and design can, can move along even as we continue to, can, you know, to assess and have conversations with the relevant parties about, about site-specific considerations. Great. Thank you. Councilman Balcom. Um, sure, thank you, um, and I appreciate the, the conversation and I appreciate this, uh, this recommendation. So um, um, my view is that this is something I feel strongly that we must do. Um, not only, I mean, we, we have to look at uh, organic, getting the organics out of the waste stream, um, curbside uh, compost, composting, and that has to go someplace. Not only, not only just residential, but uh, commercial, institutional uh, composting. And uh, it, it makes sense that we do, do it in our backyard as opposed to sending it someplace else. So I think that it's, um, it's pretty uh, imperative that we get a facility of the size and scope capacity that, that we need. Uh, and so I, I really appreciate this, uh, this recommendation. For me, when we look at the, um, the CIP and, and the next six years, I would hope that um, this, although we don't know for certain where this facility is going to be, and we may not know the full scope of this facility, I think that uh, we, I would hope that we all agree that sometime in the next six years we're gonna build this facility. So. I'm, I'm good with having this, um, uh, this CIP as proposed. Um, I understand the, because we have uncertainty, the question of whether we want to only have planning in the, in the document. Um, I think it's a different discussion if this were gen, the, uh, geo bonds versus the, um, the a fund the um, uh, the solid waste disposal disposal funds. I think those are two different uh, pressure points. Um, so uh, I'm willing to hear to hear what my colleagues have to say. Um, I'm good with where this is. I think it it says a um, not only is it important to move the project forward and to give you the resources to move the project forward. I also think it's just really important. Uh, to signal to uh, the community at large that this is something that we that we are going to do. So those are my thoughts. I appreciate those candid thoughts. I'll, I'll be even more candid uh, and say that the 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 community conversation that's taking place is about whether or not this facility should be there vis-a-vis -vis, uh, closing the incinerator. There is uh, a goal to close the incinerator. Uh, that I know the neighborhood, uh, the neighborhood, the, the, the Sugarloaf Citizens Association and many others across the county, including the county executive and many of us at the council have to close the incinerator. 
But to be very honest, you cannot close the incinerator if you continue having large volume waste that needs to go someplace. So we need to diminish the level of waste so that we can then close the incinerator. And the only way at this point in time to divert that waste is by investing in this organics facility and by doing other things that we've talked about today as well. And so there is no silver bullet, but they all work towards that same goal. And for anyone who is concerned about the incinerator remaining open, yet this project getting green lit, uh, I'd flip it. This has to be green lit so then we can close the incinerator. Um, and, and that is the only way that we're going to be uh, true to ourselves and not diverting waste to other locations, shipping it off, putting it in disadvantaged communities, or sending it to another incinerator, right? Those are all options that, that, are, that exist, and we don't want that to happen. Um, I, I will continue to raise the concern I have, uh, as I've had over the last five years when we talk about this. Um, we have fostered a very robust, small, entrepreneurial green business community here led by compost crew and veteran compost and other very entrepreneurial businesses um, that are succeeding by filling the gap that we have not yet been able to provide. Uh, and so as we move forward, uh, we, we cannot let our government supersede and close their businesses, which is what I, I very much fear, uh, especially businesses that have, have been started and predicated on environmental sustainability because that would be a very terrible signal that others who want to engage in this space will only get shut out by government who then supersedes them. So as we continue moving forward, uh, we need to be mindful of that. And that is why when uh, Director Munger or, or Mr. Lubchenco are talking about other ways to, uh, to, to, uh, to dispose of our organics, it's why in 2019, I passed the ZTA that allowed more composting on our farmland, which is an integral part of farming. There are other uses that, that are, have been debated, especially at this committee, uh, but there should be no debate that composting is part of farming. Uh, and you know, I welcome the opportunity to engage more in that and whether we have to revisit that ZTA, which still has constraints on how much can be brought in. Uh, and if it helps in the short term or medium term that we allow the, the farmers who want to engage in this work, who want to work with the, the entrepreneurs to have more composting on their facility, that would be a ZTA change, and I, I welcome that conversation. Um, and then lastly, I will say that my own neighborhood was one of the areas where the pilot program took, uh, has been going on. Uh, when I when I walk around and see the, the garbage bins and uh, I see the composting bins as well, um, I do not have one myself because I have a dual composter in my backyard. And so, uh, so I, I, I compost on my own property. Uh, but uh, it is successful. More people want to compost. We have to be able to facilitate this however we can. And we have to be mindful of the businesses that are already in this space. And Mr. Director Monger is nodding, continues to nod a lot. You hear me. I've shared this with you. Thank you. Vice President Stewart. Great. Um, well, I'll just say a few things to underscore this. Uh, Director Monger, I think the first conversation you and I ever had, I said there are two things that I ha are my top priorities. One was community choice energy, uh, and we'll put a pin in that for the moment. And the other uh, was um, organics processing uh, and our food waste. And. I really uh, look forward to seeing this move forward. I concur with Councilmember Balcom uh, because this is coming out of our solid waste disposal fund um, that keeping it in the CIP because I, I want to see this happen. Um, I think you know I'm hoping that the planning goes well uh, in the short term and that we can get right into um, some construction uh, because the demand is there. Um, I have a lot of residents in my district who have, were not picked as part of the pilot, um, and they were not so happy. Uh, and they're doing a lot on their own. Um, and I know uh, I'm fortunate to live in the city of Tacoma Park that has had curbside um, composting. And not only does it, uh, you know, is it good for our overall for our waste, it does change behavior. It makes you more intentional and thinking about your food. And I think that is the, the longer term goal here. We have 
um, as you've stated, Director Monger. It, it really does. And even in the Washington Post today, there was an article that talked about in their food section um, to eat the food you have and be mindful when you go food shopping. And I think this is all a, a piece of it. Um, so we know the demand is there. I, I agree with uh, Chair Glass as well that, you know, Building a facility to me is not just the answer. It's not like we build a facility and then we check a box because I think to truly get people to be composting, be mindful about their food, we, we should set up more community opportunities to do this. Um, and so I know uh, there's a pilot now that you're doing uh, at the farmer's market in Silver Spring. There are a lot of other opportunities, but I think we need to get this facility built and and look at other ways that we can make composting easy for folks and keep our small businesses that have been at the forefront um, in that loop. So I'm just really excited um, to see this uh, moving forward. Excellent, yeah. Um, thank you. I just, as this will most likely be end up in the Ag Reserve, uh, I, and I know you and I have talked about just bringing the community along. Yeah. Um, and uh, the, some of those issues are the, the transport of materials and how that will uh, impact uh, the, the community, as well as just making sure that the community uh, feels heard, listened to, and heard. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you both for those comments. Uh, while we're on this topic of of composting organics, I, I think it was part of the last agenda item, but can can the department just elaborate as to where the county is is still uh, doing the pilot program all these years later? Because I know it's it was supposed to expand, but as I understand it, there are some problems with expanding because we have no place to put the organics. Sure, sure, Willie, do you want to respond to that? Sure. Thank you. Willie Weiner, uh, Recycling and Resource Management. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair Glass. Uh, we have expanded the program last year uh, to a third area in the Rockville, Bethesda area. Uh, so now we have three areas, one in Silver Spring, one in Potomac, one in the Bethesda, Rockville area. Uh, each one of these areas uh, what we are targeting is a maximum of 850 homes to participate. Uh, so we need to enlarge that area in order to increase um, the number of homes that are voluntarily participating. Um, we're getting very good results from, from these areas. We, um, we get a lot of data, um, including the, the pounds per home that are being Recycle as, a, as an average right now, we are getting about nine pounds per home mm. recycled, which is really good um, uh, compared to a national level. And as you said, the uh, Chair Glass, the, the problem with that, that we're facing with keep expanding this program is the disposal side, because we're using the Prince George's County compost facility at this point. Um, we have an agreement with them, but they are uh, they're probably 90% full at this point. So they give us a little portion of what they can process, uh, 4,000 tons a year uh, to be able to bring our stuff. So that's the limitation that we have. When you think about the report that we discussed uh, earlier on with the, with the potential of 100,000 tons of material being recycled, we only have 4,000 tons at Prince George's County. So that's, that's the real limitation on the program. Thank you for expanding on that. I, as I recall a year or two ago, uh, when the proposal was to expand beyond the Silver Spring and Potomac, uh, there were two sites with their two communities that were going to be serviced and now we're only doing one? That, that is correct. We, we tried to um, expand the program into the Montgomery Village area, but the, um, um, uh, we didn't get a very good response from that area. Participation? Participation-wise. Mm. So it, 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 it wasn't cost-effective to, to do it. I mean, we, um, um, we put the RFP out, we, we got a, a response from Compost Crew, but the problem there was the, the really low participation that we were going to get 
didn't make it cost effective. So we decided to um, not start in that in that area. I'm glad I asked, and I'm glad you were you were candid in your response because uh, some of the items that we were talking about today is uh, public education and going into the community and compelling why we need to do these things. Clearly, there's more work to do. While there are neighborhoods, mm -hmm. uh, especially in District 4, mm -hmm. that are <laughs> clamoring for this, uh, there are other neighborhoods that need to be uh, brought, up, brought, on, brought up to speed. So thank you, Mr. Weiner. Um, I have no other comments on this. So without objection, uh, we will support the CIP agenda item. Mm -hmm. It is one one clarifying question with regard to the project description form. Uh, staff had suggested some, uh, perhaps some modifications to it, but I'm getting a sense of the committee that the committee is comfortable with the, the PDF as it is, especially from Ms. Balcom. I, I, so I, I don't want to unduly burden DEP with changes to a project that the committee is comfortable with. So, just wanted to see if there were any changes that the committee members thought would be useful for the project description form. Um, I was until you brought my attention to it. <laughs> Just the location, I think the location, um, if we're looking at circle four, um, if, we, if we haven't fully um, made the determination with uh, the Sugarloaf Citizens Association, I think that, that uh, we might not have that location listed. Well, I, I think it's important to note that I think the, the, the the, it is there. It is the preferred site, uh, but it's not uh, confirmed. So, I think we can make some general language in there about that. Okay. Um, and uh, specifically, the, the committee is comfortable leaving the placeholder construction dollars in. Uh, so uh, that's also a, a key aspect of the PDF. Uh, however, what, what's critical to this is the appropriation. That's what's the, the authority to spend. Right now, they have a, a $2 million appropriation, which covers basically FY25. Uh, so we would have a chance to revisit the project next year uh, if and when they're ready to move forward, with, and they would need an additional appropriation to do that. Uh, so the appropriation becomes, in some ways, the, the guardrail, if you will, uh, that allows us to revisit this if necessary next year. That works for me. Yeah, and, and I'll add, I don't think I, I noted this before, but uh, generally I would have concerns about supporting uh, funding for a project that, that, that does not yet have the legal agreement to move forward. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I think that causes uh, uh, a lot of different issues. But again, we are, we're dealing with a chicken or the egg issue mm -hmm. here. We need to move in this direction. Uh, we need, if the goal is to reduce waste and close the incinerator. And so by putting dollars down, uh, we're not losing time. And we will look to the county attorneys and DEP and, and the district council member uh, to help bring people on board and share with them why this is important to meet the shared goal that many of us have. So, uh, so with, that, um, with that modification, we'll, we'll support that modification. Uh, uh, I have no other comments, but Vice President Stewart has some. Yes, I just wanted to, um, one, say thank you um, to everyone. Um, and I know we didn't talk about it today, but we will in the future, Community Choice Energy. And I just have to say, I see Lori McGillaray sitting back there. I know many others, Stan Edwards, uh, who have worked so hard um, this year to get us to this point that we can look at how we can move forward uh, here in uh, Montgomery County on this. And I just wanted to do a, a shout out to them and to Director Monger and Ms. Colville Smugger uh, for your first budget in front of the, the, uh, the committee. Um, just thank you uh, for all your work and look forward to continuing the partnership and to everyone who came today. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. It's our residents who continue pushing us to do what we got to do, and these are not always easy decisions within the context of even a $7.1 billion budget, but we know we have no other option and we got to keep doing forward. Director Munger. We're just very grateful for today's conversation for and for your continued support. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, everybody. We're adjourned. We will continue to monitor transportation conditions throughout the day. When those conditions